Hey downtown, walking fast. I'm a seagull. Go fuck yourself. Do 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 do. disrupts my coronation. Everyone has been destroyed because of this freak. I won't allow it. These babies just saved this lame fest party. You are listening to ThisWeekInGeek.net. I'm your host, Mike the Birdman, but I'm not alone as we, well, we kind of have our season opener, but it's on a bit of a somber day. I'm joined by my compatriot in the lovely city of Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. Alex, the producer here. Okay, so to start things off, guys, we've had a sickness, weirdness, and other things that have kind of prevented the season opener for about the last week and a half, two weeks, but we are deciding to record today, and we weren't originally going to record today, because today in Canada is September 30th, and to give you a brief overview of that, that is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation when it comes to Indigenous people such as myself. Um, If you really want to learn more, I highly suggest you just type in National Day for Truth and Reconciliation uh, on Google, on YouTube, or your search engine of choice. It's otherwise known as Orange Shirt Day. I was going to say that. bank holiday. That might pop up more if you're having trouble remembering the longer name is orange shirt day yeah Um, and looking it up it is a federal they like basically the the federal government's closed and like three quarters of three quarters of the provinces recognize it as an actual holiday we don't provincially i think uh it's weird yeah yeah it it's like a bank holiday and like certain things because it's like civic holiday yeah yeah basically so if you really do want to learn more uh there are ways to do it um if i had to recommend any television series um if you happen to live in canada if you have the service crave there's a series on there called little bird which is about a 60 scoop survivor very much like myself basically long story short there a person of indigenous descent who is illegally adopted by a non-indigenous family and subject to all the abuse that goes along with that um when and yeah when, it, when the child becomes a commodity to make money from the government and not to raise the child yeah it, which is it, very much <clears throat> what happened with like me <clears throat> and my background there was an interview i did a couple of years ago with justin from uh, terrible warriors which is still available over at terriblewarriors.com i think it's under meet the makers the information there is a couple of years old but if you do want to find out more about me and sort of my journey uh, also um quig does stuff with cfru which is the radio station here in guelph ontario and they are rebroadcasting a uh, an interview I did with them on Breezy Breakfast um, a while ago where I talk about some of my advocacy work here in the city and my experience being a 60 Scoop uh, survivor. So now that I've front-loaded this with all the heavy content, like I said, please, if you want to find out more, guys, I really highly recommend you go do that. There are tons of documentaries available on uh, YouTube. There are ones available on Amazon of varying quality same with like kind of youtube i guess but again if you're curious to know what is going on why you're seeing so many orange shirts today um that is why that is so that all out of the way let's do the show we were planning on doing last week so um as we most often do we typically talk about the week that has been going on in our personal lives and for me it's been actually a lot of really cool events so first things first um 
I'm now running the social media for the Guelph Storm Trackers, which is the fan club for the Guelph Storm, which is the uh, OHL hockey team here in our city. And it's been a lot of fun. I've been posting on TikTok, uh, Twitter, and Instagram multiple times a period. And it was really kind of cool because one of the moms from one of the new players came up to the Storm Trackers table uh, this last weekend. She's like, hey, can I get my like son's button? Because we sell buttons with the uh, player's name and, and like face on them. So she bought like almost our entire supply of them. And she gave me a nice hug and she's like, I really love the work you're doing on the team's social media. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Thank you for like noticing. And then I'm filming stuff during, I think it was like the first or second period. And this uh, young woman uh, starts to stand beside me. She's like, hey, do you mind if I stand? I'm like, no, no, no. Eh. It's fine. And then she introduces herself and she's like, oh, I'm one of the, I'm so-and-so's mom. And I'm like, wait, what? Um, and it was like, wow, your son's like one of my favorite players. That's, that's fucking cool. And again, gave me a hug. She's like, I really appreciate the work you're doing. I think it's fantastic. Thank you for supporting our kids, supporting my son. Like, yeah, anytime it's fun. And it was really cool. And then just to see all the social media stats that are coming up. Like I've got like reels and highlights that are getting thousands of views. And I'm thinking, well, holy shit. Why couldn't I be this effective for twig? Um, but it was a lot of fun just kind of doing that and being uh, involved doing that. So that was a big highlight of my week. And then um, secondly, um, as you guys know, I work for, I work as a freelancer for Modifius and earlier this summer, they released the star Trek uh, adventures, second edition core book and digital. And they also had a limited amount of physical copies. Now those physical copies are out in the wild. I finally got my first physical copy of the book. And it was a trip to see my name in print in a major publication associated with a major IP. And that was just kind of cool. And then my friend Damien, who I've known for like 20 something years right now, um, I'd sent him a 3d printed, uh, tricorder as a dice holder that our mutual friend Matt had printed, uh, for me, sent it to Damien and he was able to attach magnets to it. And he painted it up like a Voyager era science tricorder. And it's incredibly neat. It's got spots for like challenge dice or extra dice or tokens or whatnot. And honestly, as far as the, I build, the build quality for being 3d printed and not on like a crazy high end 3d printer, it's pretty good. Yeah. Like I'm really impressed. Like the next time I see you and I hand this to you, you're going to be like at a distance, this could be a movie prop. Like, like I'm I, really, I impressed. held onto it. Like he, Matt passed me the, pass it to me the raw or i was gonna say file the raw printed material and i was like this is actually pretty neat i wonder what it's gonna look like when it's painted up and i saw your pictures and i went oh my god yeah it's seriously friggin legit so i'm super stoked uh to have that and that's like i said that is a trip to see my name in print hopefully i'll be doing some more stuff with modifius in the future um i still i i guess if when i do review products from them i just have to let you guys know i'm a freelancer there i mean that won't oh, affect yeah, my yeah. opinion but i still have to be full kind of disclosure like hey if this book's awesome it's awesome if it sucks well i'll let you know um yeah. but yeah <laughs> well ba basically you don't have to recuse yourself you just have to declare hey i have a stake if it's particularly a book that you've written on you'll have to make a comment and be like hey i, I wrote this wrote this book if that's the case if there's another material that you've written then you might have to pass it over to me <laughs> yeah yeah exactly i'm, I'm gonna have to like hey can you look at this please can you look, can you look at this and please don't you know massacre me just because you think it's funny no i would never do that but you know it it's just you know you got to be somewhat uh impartial to it right yeah e exactly and for those of you uh here's a little easter egg nod um you may notice a familiar last name in that book as i 
decide to give a little bit of a nod to Alex here as a panic Federation colonist. Well, um, maybe who's like, maybe I shouldn't review it either. <laughs> you're like the Borg around here, the Klingons, the Orions. What do I do? What have I gotten myself into? <laughs> and I think I'm going to be interviewed on a Star Trek Adventures podcast sometime in the next little bit. I think it's called Continuing Missions. Um, I haven't got the details precisely worked out for that, but they talked to writers and contributors. Aaron's been on the show a number of times. So I'm looking forward to joining that club in the future. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to finally have my book physically in hand. And then as for what I've been playing recently, um, well, I am playing through a couple games for review. I know next week I'm going to have the Castlevania Dominus collection, which is the uh, collection of all the DS games along with with a uh, updated version of the original arcade game, which is a lot of friggin' fun. Um, and I'm also playing through, I just got Mortal Kombat 1's Chaos Reigns DLC. So I'm doing a complete refresher by going through the story mode again of MK1. And it's pretty cool. So I'm going to have that for you next week. And I've also been playing with a bunch of the new uh, Transformers that got sent over by Hasbro. They sent us over a Transformers 1 uh, care package, and they also sent us over our stuff for our annual holiday gift guide. I know one of the big highlights for me this year is going to be the newest G.I. Joe collaboration. This year, it's Sergeant Slaughter and the character of Cup, where he appears as the Triple T, which is uh, Sergeant Slaughter's little white tank thing. And so far, I'm really impressed. I'm going to say this is the third best collaboration I've seen this year. This year has been a banger for collaboration. So I'll share those thoughts in just a couple of weeks. And that's what I've been up to. Alex, what about you? Well, uh, other than if you've been watching, putting together all the reviews that have sort of come in at the end of the summer uh, that I wanted to make sure were out before everything got too crowded in October, <laughs> I... Uh, did some cleaning in my place, did some reorganizing around. I had planned to go out into the movies to see a whole bunch of stuff. And then I got hit with what might be the flu. Definitely wasn't COVID because I tested myself, but I was like, I was hit with like the malaise of the most tiredness of all time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I was like, how, <clears throat> how have I slept this much? And I'm still tired. And then literally like after three or four days of that, it's like a light switch went off and I was like, I'm fine. I'm completely normal. I'm like, what the hell was that? Like, there was no, like, transition between being tired and, like, like sinus infection to, like, normal. It just happened. And I'm like, okay, I'm fine there. So I ended up having my mother come over. She was like, I oh, need to get out of the house and do something. I'm like, why don't you come over? She came over. And we watched that new Brad Pitt, George Clooney movie, Wolves, um, mm -hmm. which, is, which was fun. Uh, and then beyond that, I've just been playing a lot of games, catching up on things and, and uh, checking out different things like computer hardware that I've been reviewing. I'll have a review of one of those things in uh, the show this week and getting some stuff prepped. I even went back. We had a, uh, it's not the first time, but we had somebody on YouTube ask us, Hey, could you, uh, you know, do you know where I can find and listen to the, the old uh, James Rolfe Halloween specials you guys did? And I'm like, yeah, we, I know we've got a few of them. He's like, no, no, the ones from like olden times. And I went, you're in luck because I found a backup archive that we did that was not very well labeled. I will say this right now. We did not have, before I came on, a custodian when it came to the digital library of what we had. Yeah, uh, like because it was basically me and I was overwhelmed. It's not even that. It's it's going back to the start of the website. Like we're talking 2007. When I guess would would it have been Steve that was working on it back yeah. then? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. th you you want to know how things were labeled? Here's peeling the curtain back, folks. Episodes were labeled with like six letters. It was like twig and then like a number for what number of week it was. No oh Jesus! E no, Even no I didn't know this. <laughs> no descriptions as an MP3 file, and then of course recompressed from an MP3 to an MP3 in whatever format it was, and. Uh, no descriptions, no, the order on the back end, it was all in like the root directory. There were no folders. It was all, so like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes that were all like seven letters long with no descriptions. 
Oh, jeez. And that's, that's a lot. In, 20, in 2018 or 2017, I started, you know, working with you and we started sort of saving it that way. And I started saving things at least within a folder for the type of show that it was and then mm -hmm. labeling it a little bit. And then I would sort of keep a mental note and I'm like, this is still not going to be great. And when we did the big transition in 2020 to the new website, I was able to archive everything that was there. Didn't know what anything was. The reason that a lot of our stuff was not no longer available to listen to from prior to that date was because when you transitioned, it tried to pull the metadata and there just wasn't. <laughs> it's just like, there's, there's no information as to what these episodes are. They exist. We, we don't know the, the varying quality of them. And like, I'm like, oh, is, is it a twig episode? Is it a toy box episode? Is it a Mike and Laura episode? There's, there was like almost no idea. Like some of them would be labeled and then some wouldn't be. And you could sort of tell like when you did it, it was a little easier to read. Uh, and even when Blanchard was doing it, it was a little easier to read. Like you could tell the stuff that was Steve <laughs> because back then you had no idea you were going to go on this long. Right. So it's not a big deal. You're like, oh, we might only do 50 episodes. So, you know, you could just label them, you know, one to 50. And then, you know, I'm going through it. I'm like, okay, so this one is episode 114, is it? Or is it 0114? Or is it, what, what the hell is going on? So anyway, I had slowly been going through and trying to archive and be like, what is what? What is this? What is this? And like, this one says aliens. Is this the alien commentary? Is this the aliens commentary? Or is this the alien, uh, aliens Halloween special? And luckily enough, it was the Halloween special. And right around that time is when somebody contacted there. And I'd had a few emails from people before saying, hey, can we find some of the gold classic stuff? And I'm like, I'll get to it. <laughs> I don't know when, but I have to physically go and listen to each one to figure out what they are recategorize it then i have to try to clean up the audio if i can if it needs to be cleaned up if there's anything because what's odd is some of the audio that was on there i don't know if it was what was the audio that made it to actual air because sometimes there's stuff at the beginning and at the end like after we close out a show and you're like and we're clear but there'd be still talking after i'm like there's this can't be the file that came out because there's people talking shop talk afterwards on this file. So I'm like, I don't know what this is anyway. Uh, and I, I told this person, they're like, Hey, I'm, I'll give you money. If you do like, no, you don't have to give us money. We'll put the stuff out. We're going to put the stuff out. We're, we're not doing this. We're not taking bribes to put out old shows for you. You, you can listen to the old shows. It's just going to take us a little bit of time. So I have gone and taken a bunch of the, uh, the James Rolfe episodes that I've got two of them ready. I'm probably going to have a couple more after that. Once I've filtered through ready to go on each Saturday, they're going to be the Halloween specials from before 2018. So basically before when I joined and those are, are going to come out on a Saturday, they're going to be basically uncut. Um, they might have something trimmed at the end, tr trimmed at the beginning. I will have a preface before each one is if you've listened to this, you probably listened to the first one we put out. And it's basically me coming in and saying, hey, you know, there's going to be some audio artifacts in here. These are old mono recordings from when we did everything in mono. You know, a, a glimpse into the past of traditional old school uh, podcasting. Uh, you'll hear some familiar faces. You might hear some that you don't remember anymore. And you'll also uh, you just sort of get to see a, a gaze into something from, you know, more almost 10 years or more older. And there, you got to know that any of the advertisements that we have in them that aren't, you know, dynamically inserted, but like that were uh, on air reads or sponsors are not going to be endorsements anymore from us because they're in some cases, some of the companies don't exist anymore. <laughs> uh, that's how, you know, you've been a podcast for a long time, right? Uh, as well as uh, we've also got uh, like the closing thing. We don't have a call in number anymore. So I had to do a little warning here and there on that. But that's basically what I've been doing is I've been prepping some of that stuff. So for anybody that's wanted to listen to some of the classics, those will be coming out on Saturdays. And then come the future, we'll probably do other random special episodes, maybe some interviews or maybe some topic shows that will sort of fill the gaps on, uh, you know, content that we know people have wanted to hear, but we just hadn't had a chance to be able to archive. And that's, uh, that's basically been my week. Yeah, I mean, I hope I didn't say anything too problematic back oh, in no, those no, old no, no. episodes. That the warning is, hey, 
people are young, they say stupid things, they're more edgy, whatever. It's not even that. My concern was, hey, we probably shouldn't be advertising a product that either doesn't exist anymore, or more importantly, telling people to call us at our call in, like, when, when the, the old outro would have, like, Steve saying, call us at our call in line, it's like, well, we don't have that number anymore, so. But, you ain't, but, you ain't, so yeah, we haven't had that for, like, 10 years. It's been a long would, time. Like, I think when I first joined in 2017, we had it still running until the early 2018, and we we only had a few random calls and we we're just like, we're just not going to keep it anymore because people aren't communicating with us that way. They're doing it via social media or email. So it's like, okay, I should make sure that I mentioned, don't call that freaking number. Listen at the very end. If you need to contact us, if you have a question about these classic episodes, contact me, you know, Alex and this week in geek or contact the feedback or contact Mike. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. So, yeah, guys, we have a lot of good show coming out for you today. We got a lot of reviews. One of the first reviews we're going to be taking a look as one of mine. We're going to be looking at the recent, recently released Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster. We got sent a review code from Capcom. We're also going to be taking a look at our at something that our friends from Warner Brothers Home Entertainment sent over and Adult Swim. We're going to be taking a look at seasons one to seven of Rick and Morty on DVD. And what do we got coming up from you, Alex? I have another Be Quiet. Uh, computer hardware uh, piece which is the light loop which is a, a, a liquid cooler for all modern CPUs that is full RGB alright cool so we will be taking a look at that and more right here on thisweekingeek.net but before we go let's take a trip to Willamette Colorado with photojournalist Frank West hey can you get me on the rooftop of that mall you gotta be kidding me oh, man you are nuts alright listen don't forget to come back for me. As long as you're not dead, Fred. It's Frank. Frank West. Remember that name, because the whole world's going to know it in three days when I get to school. All right. Hey, guys, this is Mike the Birdman here. I'm here to talk about a game we got sent for review to us by Capcom. I'm going to be taking a look at Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster. So this is the first Dead Rising game redone in the Resident Evil engine, which means this game looks awesome. It plays the exact same as it did way back when, but there are some updated uh, controls here that give you the option to move while you're shooting, which, believe me, will come in handy. There's also been some other quality of life improvements made along the way. And uh, you do get some new costumes uh, if you play the if you get the deluxe edition. But you can also buy these costumes uh, a la carte. I played through this game in the entirety in Chris Redfield's outfit from the first Resident Evil game, and I'm currently doing another playthrough in Leon's outfit from Resident Evil 2, which I do think is actually kind of kick ass. So I don't need to tell you the story. This is the story of Frank West, photojournalist, going to Wilm. Will met Colorado or something like that. Basically, uh, there has been a incident which involves the undead, and Frank West is there to solve the case before uh, it's basically too late and the truth is lost. And it's a one of the classic games on the Xbox 360. We have seen multiple releases over the years, but this game does have some pretty significant changes other than just some of the quality of life uh, improvements. Some of the psychos have been changed, and if you want to find out more about those, you can go online and read any number of different articles. Um, I actually kind of prefer the new, uh, the new psycho that you encounter in the butcher shop. I just think it's a lot more uh, deranged and a little less, well... I'm not going to say it. Anyway, um, they also have removed the erotica uh, subgenre when you're taking pictures. And I would say in some ways, this game feels a little bit easier. I don't know if they've modified the difficulty, but it feels like I was struggling more back in the Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and even the original Xbox 360 days. Uh, but still, I had a fantastic time with this game. I was able to... Uh, get through this entire game, get the best ending possible. And I'm really hoping this means they're going to do the rest of the Dead Rising games. Like, I hope we get a deluxe remaster of Dead Rising 2 and Case West and Dead Rising 2 Off the Record and a proper uh, PlayStation 5 version of Dead Rising 3, which I don't know whether that's stuck to the, three, six, to the Xbox One or not. Do not quote me on that. But is the game worth your time and money? Well, if you like the original Dead Rising, I'm going to say sure. I mean, it's the exact same game you've played before, but it looks gorgeous. And having the ability to move and shoot 
actually does change the game up a fair chunk, which means you can now headshot the undead and it really kind of matters. It also seems like uh, survivors are a lot less dumb now. And if you know how to do this game, a lot of your muscle memory is going to be there from before. Like this is a game I almost had a perfect run the first time that I went through it because I knew how to get all my survivors, which order to get them in and whatnot. And it's pretty cool. This is one of those games where I think I could reasonably platinum this game. Uh, and I might even do that over the holidays when I've got uh, some free time. Now, for those of you that are new to the Dead Rising franchise, I do think this is the best way to play the game because it plays great. It looks amazing. However, that being said, it is a little bit weird hearing a new voice come out of Frank West, and there has been some discussions where the original team didn't even ask the guy to come back. And it's not that the new Frank is bad, because he's not, but it's not the voice that I was expecting. Like, certain intonations and inflections from the original Frank West just would have suited this a lot better. It wouldn't surprise me if somebody mods in the original dialogue uh, into this game and you can maybe play that on like PC or something that really wouldn't surprise me but it's fun I mean I had a lot of fun uh, playing this game once I got the real mega buster in this the game became a cakewalk but that's fun I just wanted to play this game enjoy some mindless zombie slaughter as we as we approach spooky season coming up in October um, I believe there's going to be a physical version of this released in November I want to say and maybe there'll be some more uh, cool stuff included with that. But right now you can buy this game digital and uh, you can get this across any number of different platforms. I played this primarily on the PlayStation 5. I only had one crash, but I would consider that an anomaly because I was not able to repeat the circumstances in which that crash happened. Um, I never had a corrupted save. I never had any real uh, issues other than the fact that I messed up my perfect run because I forgot to grab somebody at a certain time. But other than that, though, Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster, it's a fun experience. It's a new game. It's an old game with a fresh coat of paint. And I think it's fun. Um, I wouldn't surprise me if there if there's a sale on this come next month, especially with like Halloween coming up. And if this game sells well, I really hope they'll do more uh, in this um, in this kind of deluxe remaster because I would love to play as Chuck Green and going through Fortune City again or play as Nick and go through. I think it's Lost Perdidos uh, once again, making bizarre and strange weapons. So anyway, guys, that is my review of Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster on the PlayStation 5. Once again, a review copy was provided to us by Capcom. Everyone used to laugh at me. I was a walking punchline. <laughs> it was not in me. <laughs> when the zombies came, everyone died. <laughs> The Prime Minister of Sweden visited Washington today, and my tiny little nipples went to France. Gossip, rumors, panic in the streets. We're lucky. This Week in Geek News. Hey guys, welcome back to thisweekingeek.net. I almost forgot where I was. It feels like it's been a while. But anyway, I'm Mike the Birdman. He's Alex it the producer. It has been a while, buddy. Yeah, like it's just it's been a while since we've done like a regular kind of news show, but hopefully we'll get a bunch of these done, even though we've got Thanksgiving coming up soon. But we'll talk about that at some point, I'm sure. So anyway, we have two news stories for you this week, but they're both pretty meaty, all things considered. And our first story comes courtesy of Gizmodo.com, and it says a new Robocop series is marching ahead at Amazon. Amazon just took a big step forward on a show that will cost significantly more than a dollar. A new series based on Paul Verhoeven's 1987 classic Robocop has been in the works for about a year and now has a streamer set up, Peter Oko, uh, who also did Ledger uh, or also did Ledge or Lodge 49 and Moonhaven as its showrunner. And none other than James Wan is one of the executive producers. The log line of the show, according to Variety, is, quote, a giant tech conglomerate collaborates with the local police department to introduce a new tech 
technologically advanced uh, enforcer to combat rising crime, a police officer who's part man, part machine. So basically the plot of the first movie. Last year, RoboCop was at the top of a list of properties Amazon wanted to uh, wanted to resurrect after its acquisition of MGM. It's unclear exactly what direction the show will take or how it will be different from other I- iterations, but Oko's uh, experience he's also worked on The Leftovers, The Office, Elementary, Black Sales, and Pushing Daisies, and the vision of Juan's uh, company, Atomic Monster. You have a sense it'll be tonally or thematically along the lines of the original film. The original RoboCop was one of those movies that captured a moment adored by both adults who got it and kids who did not. It was a big enough success that it spawned two sequels. It was rebooted back in 2014, had multiple iterations on TV. None of the TV versions were that memorable, though a late 80s animated series did have 40 episodes, and it, this is me sidebarring it. It did have two other animated series. There's Robocop, Alpha Commando, and I think there was another series. Uh, uh, so there was, uh, Robocop, Alpha Commando, and then just Robocop was the animated Yeah. Thing. Or something there, like that. Yeah. And then there was uh, Shadow something. Uh, there was Prime Directives, which was a series oh, Prime, of oh, four movies. Right. Shadow Chronicles was the uh, Robotech was the Robotech one, which is also yeah. to not be confused with the Roughneck Show. <laughs> yeah, there so a lot plus, of R-rated car- show movies made into kids shows for a while. Oh yeah. So plus, this is Amazon, a company that spends about a gazillion dollars on. Lord of the Rings. RoboCop isn't quite Lord of the Rings in terms of name recognition, but it's well known enough that you'll that that you'd assure that it'll get a significant investment. Also, the show is half subversive, interesting, and as fun as the original movie, it could be very intriguing. So what do you think here? Blah 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 blah. Then it just asks, what do you think? Um, okay. So depending on how this show is written. I could see this being very well received because it's not like we're not used to over the top violence. This is Amazon that does the boys. We are not strangers to violence. We've had giant penises explode. We've had bizarre superhero sex orgies. We've watched a person get turned into a splatter by a speedster running through somebody. Um, Yeah, this could be really well done but it has to be cheeky. It has to be funny and it has to say something like, and considering the, the glut of cable television news shows that we have, like the daily show, um, late night with Stephen Colbert, um, Mm -hmm. last week tonight, there's a lot of funny news commentators where I would love to almost see some of those writers take a shot at writing the news break uh, commentaries now be, before Wong, uh, before Wong, before long, I hope they introduce the media break fake commercials. And I would like to see guest directors do little bits, kind of like you had with the Grindhouse trailers a number of years yeah. ago with Hobo w- with a shotgun. So, as, as much as, as he's kind of divisive on, on how good of a director he is. I do think like Eli Roth could make a really good short, like a really good, you know, interstitial commercials. Yeah. Like Um, honestly, like borderlands, the movie, notwithstanding, I do like Eli Roth, like for every cabin fever and hostile, you'll get like the clock in the walls. I think was a movie he did. Um, But You'll get some interesting stuff out of him, but the guy's, fu- he, he knows funny when you give him the chance. And if you get someone like Jon Stewart or Colbert or whoever doing media break, I mean, it's not going to be like, this is media break with Casey Wong. Like, you're not going to get the guys from Entertainment Tonight because it was like Lisa Gibbons, I think, was the other co host on the media break segments. But those could be really fucking funny. Like I think you you could have a real bit of fun with that, oh, for um, sure. but how do you cast Alex Murphy? You can't get Peter Weller, but I think there's a spot for Peter Weller to do a cameo that would make sense. And I'm not saying you put him as the old man of OCP no. because the last time we did that, we had him old man RoboCop and Star Trek into darkness. And it was a little weird. You, um, you, you want to have some fun subversiveness, put a fake mm. mustache on him and have him be the, I buy that for a dollar guy. 
just for I... and, and don't even show the whole commercial. Have it on in the background on like a in like a bar on a television and people are laughing at it and just have him do I'd buy that for a dollar and you'd be like, Is that Peter Weller? And Yeah. Like Again, it's one of those things where I think you could do something really interesting with it. Because, like I said, we live in this 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 unfortunate paradise of corporate malfeasance right now, where you could like we are living in RoboCop right now, um, and it would be very interesting to see what kind of storylines they want to bring. What is the story? of you know tech merging with man i mean i know you have elon musk who wants to introduce the brain chips in the people and the ones they've tested on chimpanzees haven't gone over too well he can't even um, build a pickup truck how is he going to connect your brain without it exploding yeah like i'm not willing to trust that i mean it would be kind of funny if they took shots at people like um, Elon Musk, because I know even in the sh- like even in the movies and in the comics, they oh. talk about uh, if- there was Bob Morton, there was Doctor uh, the guy Doctor McNamara is the guy who invented Ed two hundred nine, and that's something too. If you're gonna do Ed two hundred nine, has to be a mix of practical, bring back the Phil Tippett era special and if, effects. And if you're trying to like make it maybe a little more reflective of current culture have it be about detroit but and you could make the secret like oh made in america ingenuity and then it turns out it's all made in china and that's why yeah. it's falling apart it's even worse yeah. than detroit like like have it be that or have like instead of the was it the 4000 sux the sucks car or was it 2000 yeah. sux 6000 sux yeah you have that make, make, we now have a an all-electric model and make it look like the cyber truck and it just yeah. and it just blows up. <laughs> or like if they really wanted to be super subversive, they could say, uh, this was built proudly, excuse me, built proudly in Mexico, which has ne- now become this automotive powerhouse in yeah. Detroit, known or- as the motor city. Like, well, we have to import all our batteries from Venezuela. What do you want us to do? And there, like design- there's a storyline. Design, designed and made in Detroit, but it turns out all the parts are from like third world countries, and it's just and it's assembled by, uh, by like day laborers in in Detroit. It's not even it's not even assembled by like actual citizens. Like really play into the corporate greed culture where everything's made overseas. It's all made by undocumented immigrants, and and the only people in Detroit that sign off on it are the the people in the boardroom. See, I don't even think I would use undocumented immigrants. What I might do is it's something they've done in um, a role-playing game universe called Shadowrun, and they talk about people that are sinless, so people who don't have a social insurance number. So rather than undocumented immigrants, they're just people who are born in America, but they've slipped oh. through the cracks of the system. So you have right. a whole slice of life of America, and it's, it's anybody- showing – it's anybody who owes their me- on their medical bills because they're uninsured. Yeah, there the un- you go. The, un- the uninsured. Oh, we we cover your health care, but they don't pay for anything else. They'll cover your health care, but not for things that you not for injuries you get at work. <laughs> it's to cover the debt that you owe from like having your tonsils out. You have to go work in the factory. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, that's kind of clever. Like, it's a show that I think could be really good, but it has to be carried by the right lead. The writing has to be on the wall. You have to bring in good people to represent the old man, people to do Dick Jones. And that's a a thing, too, is when do you set it? Do you set it at the beginning of RoboCop's career? Do you establish that RoboCop 1 has already happened? Who would be some of your picks for like the old man at, at this point, like, is there an actor that's the right age, right look that would be willing to do it that you could think of? Um, if I could convince them to come back, cause I think it would be a great nod to the series. Get Kurt Wood Smith. He's still alive as the old man. Yeah. Get Clarence Bodiger to come back as the old man, because he's done roles where he's really sweet, but also he can be villainous too. And the old man around no. RoboCop two turned into kind of a scumbag. That could work. Uh, I would say, yeah. Ronnie Cox is still alive. No, I, didn't, didn't he just die? I'm starting to. I'm starting to. I'm wondering. I'm checking right now because 
because I I seem to remember that we reported his death, but maybe we yeah didn't. I'm not sure yeah but we I have know not, Kurt we have not reported his death he's 86 but I don't think I don't think he's working anymore so maybe sorry. a cameo maybe a cameo uh, yeah like maybe he he's old enough to play the old man um, but beyond that like I'm thinking um, if I had to choose like who I think would be great for those particular roles. I don't know if he would do it because he's doing other shows, but like Gary Oldman could be good as one of the old guys. Uh, but if and looking... he was in the reboot in 2014. Oh, I'd, I've never seen that because I, it looks so terrible. Um, it's worth seeing once. It's uh, my uncle worked on it, and he just told me to avoid like the plague. So uh, <laughs> I, that told me something. I was like, no, okay, Uncle John, you said don't watch it. I'm not watching it. Um, thinking of some of the other people in it like there there's a lot of actors and and that who do you get to play robo is probably the the bigger deal like because a lot of it is going to be shown where they're not seeing their face right yeah like you want a carl urban type because carl urban looks really good as dread you want somebody who's willing to not show their face and still put in the performance and they have to be good at doing like the pantomime movements and stuff Mm -hmm. so that could be difficult there some of the other roles could be filled up pretty a uh, little easier. Um, and even if they wanted to reference the old uh, live action series, if they wanted to put in bad guys like Bone Machine and Pud Face and stuff like that, you could do it. Like RoboCop could have some of that weird meta humor where it references its own stuff. Like I know like there was a, there was a guy we interviewed years ago and I'm talking in, in the early years of twig. He was on the X files, but he also did one of the voices in Robocop alpha commando, Dean Hagland. You could bring him on for a guest star role. Like you could literally fill this with a lot of the people who've worked in Robocop as a franchise, like Tom Nunian, who played Kane, the kid who played Hobbs. You could bring him back. Um, I think Paige Fletcher, I think he was the guy who played RoboCop in Prime Directives in RoboCop 3, or maybe I can't remember. But either way, you could bring he's, a lot of these character yeah, actors back. He's either, he's either RoboCop 3 or he's the he's not the Canadian TV show, is he? He might be. I'm not sure. But, but you, know, you know who would be a good fit? If not, if they're not going to go with the exact same characters, mm -hmm. but like an, an OCP corporate sleazeball? Mm-hmm. Uh, Liev Schreiber would be good, and I don't think he's doing any big TV shows now that Ray Donovan's over. And, and I'm trying to else. figure where I would put him. I would put him as a Clarence Boddicker type. Yeah, I could, I could totally see that. Um, I'm trying to think of anybody else. Like, as you, you got There's a lot of. I mean, the ultimate evil sleazeball person to do, but I don't know if he's he's kind of blacklisted from being cast at this point. Would be like James Woods. <laughs> yeah, uh, like like I, can't, I like, could see him as a Bob Morton type uh but he's he's old and people hate him so who knows yeah because he's kind of a scumbag yeah uh, um but, but there's a there's a bunch of other people you could throw in there like uh you also got to consider if it's a tv show they're gonna be focusing not just on the same character every time there's gonna be more of a focus likely on some of the other police and lewis reed yeah so there's gonna be roosevelt it's gonna be a bunch of like it could because you're going to have, not that you're going to have episodes that don't focus on Robo, but like there is going to be more time to show off fellow officers and, and police and, and what is going on. So there's, there's going to be, there's stuff like, I, I don't want to speculate too much till we see like the tone they want to go for. Mm -hmm. Because once they figure the tone out, that'll really show who they're going to actually put in place, right? Like, um, are they going to go pure, much more comedy than, than that could influence who they cast? Do they want to go, you know, much more serious and dark, or do they want to go ridiculously stupid where it doesn't even look like RoboCop, like the the remake? <laughs> like the remake didn't even look like RoboCop. Let's be real. I mean, I liked the look of RoboCop in the remake when it was the silver armor. They're like, this is the prototype armor, and then Gary Oldman's character was like, well, can we try it in black? Who the and hell did they cast as as the RoboCop in that Joel again? Joel Joel Kinnaman, so the guy who played Rick Flag in the Suicide Squad movie. Okay, so so not so a bad guy. You, you, or they could play tricks on us and just 
cast two different actors to play the same role and nobody would be able to tell the difference. Put like Jai Courtney and uh, what's his other name? Uh, Jai Courtney, what's the other guy that... Uh, Actually, I know you're being facetious here, but Jai Courtney is not a bad pick. And well, what I mean by that is I liked him as Kyle Reese in Terminator Genesis. I am one of the few people who actually will defend that movie. Who's the who's, uh, who's the dude from Avatar that was in a lot of Oh, Sam uh Sam Worthington. Yeah, th I, those two are basically the same person. You could just cast them both and cover their cover their eyes and they're the same guy so we wouldn't even know. <laughs> I think I think Jai Courtney's funnier. Um, I think he's got a little bit more charisma, whereas Sam I mean, Worthington's a little bit more intense. Gerard if you Butler's want drama, you nowhere. go with Worthington. Gerard Butler's yeah. is not nowhere. He could be cast in this in, in pretty much any role and be happy to get it. You know what I would do with him? There's a side character, and again, this is me going through the weeds here, but there's a SWAT TV captain, or sorry, there's a SWAT captain in the first movie and his name's Hancock and he's talking down the mayor and Robocop punches the guy through the window in the animated series. One of the few tapes I owned as a kid on VHS was an episode of Robocop, the animated series. And it was called man in the iron suit. And it's where OCP was field testing a new piece of technology where it basically gave a guy in a suit, the ability to be as powerful as RoboCop and it was Hancock who was in the armor. And at the end of the episode, RoboCop and Hancock are doing this like mock trial where they're doing combat. They're fighting Ed two sixties and they're kicking the shit out of each other. But at one point Hancock gets the upper hand and starts to beat the crap out of Robo. Robo turns the tables on him and he starts tearing the suit apart because Hancock takes a shot at Lewis and almost kills her. And RoboCop goes nuts and starts ripping at Hancock's suit and he's about to kill him. I would love to see that recreated on the screen. And I think a character like Gerard or sorry, like an actor that you just mentioned, if you put him in the Hancock role, you could do some fun things with that. Like this would be a show. If I were to ever get a screenwriting credit in Hollywood, this would be the second. No, actually, you know what? This would be the first series I'd want to work on. Maybe the Noah Hawley, Alien Earth series would be well, my first pick, but do you know who would be perfect for an OCP corporate executive? Who? Dude from Fallout, Walton Goggins. Yes, I could totally see like, that's and, your Bob and, Morton right you, there. And and how you explain it is like he's got his accent. They're being like so, uh, they're like, "Oh god, some corporate takeover is coming to Detroit and it's the uh, some tycoon from the south they're coming in to take over they brought and, him in from austin he used to run tesla yeah, or SpaceX. yeah, he's, he's, or yeah, he, shit. yeah it's like he's he's brought in from like atlanta or something they're, they're like what like some you know they own like monsanto or one of those sort of, sort of like bio companies and he's brought in he's like oh, i'm here i'm here to help i'm here and really he's he's even worse he's there to like cutthroat people to the you know and have that shit eating grin the whole time talking and that would and, be fucking brilliant and what makes him perfect is he can show up on television smile with the children and and talk about all the great things they're doing and then as soon as the commercial's off he's like get those fucks away from me before i melt them down you know <laughs> like like he could just be like a complete sleazeball he'd be perfect he's he's already a cartoon character yeah i completely agree and, and he's already working for you know amazon for Amazon, a lot of times they'll use the same actors for different, you know, projects they got. Amazon, you've got my phone number. Give me a call. All <laughs> right, guys, we're going to move on to our second uh, sh um, yeah, story here. Sorry, my computer keeps randomly switching its screen off. I'm going to have to fix that. All right. So anyway, this story comes courtesy of Deadline. And this one kind of surprised me, but I can't say at the same time it didn't. So according to Deadline and confirmed by multiple outlets, Chucky has been canceled by Sci-Fi and USA after three seasons, leaving creator Don Mancini, quote, heartbroken but grateful amid NBCU cable scripted shift. Chucky's murderous days are over for at least for now. The series based on the classic horror movie franchise will not return for a fourth season on Sci-Fi and the USA Network. The news comes four months after part two of Chucky's third season aired its finale on both NBC Universal uh, 
Cable Networks. Series creator and executive producer Don Mancini has been looking to carry on. He revealed in April he he had pitched a four season, saying the time is quote it's something I really like to do. His enthusiasm helped spring the quote renew Chucky fan campaign, which had been rallying support for season four. Needless to say, today's outcome is not what he had hoped for. But Mancini, who also created and wrote the movie franchise, remained graceful in his reaction, vowing that Chucky. Or sorry, vowing that this is not Chucky's last spree. Quote, I'm heartbroken over the news that Chucky won't be coming back for a fourth season, but I'm also so grateful for a killer three years we did have. He said, I'd like to thank the UCP slash slash sci-fi slash peacock slash eat the cat our awesome cast our toronto-based crew the best in the business and finally to our amazing fans a big bloody hug your incredible uh renew chucky campaign really warmed chucky's cold heart chucky will return he always comes back this marks the end of an era for sci-fi chucky was the last higher end ucp produced original scripted series on the network, the other one, Resident Alien, recently moved to USA with a significant budget reduction. Amid the sobering reality of the declining ad-supported cable business in the cord-cutting era, sci-fi is now relying on Canadian surreal estate, the upcoming revival, and modestly budget independent productions like oh, Electric Entertainment's The Ark for the, its original scripted offerings. Chucky was also one of the signs for what was to come. Originally greenlit by Sci-Fi, it ended up being shared with USA so the two networks could share the cut. As for USA, after phasing out its scripted originals in the last couple of years, the network is back in the game with a budget-conscious Blue Sky procedurals harkening back to the USA's, or sorry, harkening back to the network's heyday of hits like Monk, Psych, Suits, and White Collar. The first series under the initiative is the upcoming Rainmaker based upon the John Grissom novel. Chucky, the series following the murderous rampage of the notorious killer doll, Chucky crosses paths with arch enemies like old allies and new prey as he seeks to inspire fear and mayhem wherever he goes. Season three saw Chucky uh, ensconced with the most powerful family in the world, America's first family, inside the infamous walls of the White House. How did Chucky wind up here? What in God's name does he want? And how can Jake, Devin, and Lexi um, possibly get Chucky inside the world's most secure building, all while balancing the pressure of a romantic relationship and growing up? Meanwhile, Tiffany facing a looming crisis of her own as the police closing on her and Jennifer Tilly's murderous lamp rampage last season. This is a show that... I liked initially. I saw parts uh, of season yeah. two. I never finished season three. I saw season one, enjoyed what I saw for the most part, mm -hmm. and I hated season two and stopped watching. Season two, I think, had some good ideas, but it was, it, it was lost boring. interest in me. It was like, I don't know how you can say it's like, I know it's objectively not boring. I was bored mm -hmm. watching it. I'm like, Okay, this is enough. I don't feel that Chucky warrants a television show. I think we would have been better served with four or five TV movies. If if they had said, hey, we're going to do a sci-fi TV movie every four months, and it's going to be a continuing story of Chucky, but they're going to be slightly higher quality, but cheaper to make than a whole TV show, I think we would have been better off with you know five or six tv movies see i'm okay with the series when it got a little bit goofy i was like eh. season it, one it, i thought was great season it two started to evolve into like i when i started watching season two my thought was i wish we were watching ash versus evil dead instead yeah it's like I don't know. And that's a, like, you can do that within reason to like introduce, like, cause the Chucky franchise has always had its kind of finger on the weirdness that is horror movies. When Ronnie, I think it was Ronnie, you did bride of Chucky. It leaned into its horror comedy roots and that's fine. And you know, some of the sequels are good and some of them are less good. We shall say, um, but the series always had its edge in humor. The, the, the television series, I think, balanced that where it became really good. The problem is I just don't think the narrative was as strong. When you started introducing old characters, okay, cool, that's great. 
it became but, a, mem- a member berry show and no longer yeah, so fur- and then furthering with- itself. And beyond that, it also it felt like it ran out of it felt like it was meant to be a mini series, and then it got they're like, hey, this was good enough to get a second season. Yeah, like it's something I think you could do, but I think the writing team maybe needed to be a little less on the humor and more on let's give him a compelling narrative, which is yeah. why I think season three, putting him in the White House, that's maybe a little bit of a step too far. I like the idea of splitting his soul into many different Chucky dolls. So there's many representations, there's many avatars, and you're hunting them down to try and find the alpha Chucky. Like, that's cool. I like that idea. That's yeah. neat. Maybe dive into some of the other lore. Now, like I said, I haven't seen season season three outside of the clips that have been available online, so I can't commentate as to the content of the, of the third was on season. The wall when it was initially announced in the first place to be split amongst two different channels and then eventually three. It's like, mm. I know that, like, they're like, oh, it's a prestige. It's not a high budget show. It was made in Toronto, dirt cheap but they're trying to pretend like it was an expensive show. It was not. The fact that they canceled this is not based, I think, even on ratings. I think it's just they want to get out of the game entirely. Yeah, so like, I wouldn't be purely surprised. a budgetary thing. This, to me, sounds like something Shudder would contact UCP about and be like, hey, we, w- we either want to bring it back for a limited run or maybe Shudder does a couple TV movies. See, that's what I said. I actually posted to someone who's a fairly well-known horror a uh, fixture on or in the so the so social media space and Don Mancini was in this conversation and I said to both of them like why don't you get Shutter to pick this up because they're not doing creep show anymore as far yeah. as as I can tell so what I would do is let's say there's not enough gas in the tank for a full s- season that's fine let's do one really good tv movie let's wrap the series or, for now to you know put how companies a bow want tri- on the series you know companies want trilogies this would be the time where you're like let's get one good story and split it into three 75 minute specials yeah and you like could, and you could do that you could split it up and then you get your content where and I, I don't mean split it up over three years that's too much but if they're like, hey, first one premieres in October, next one premieres next spring, and then again, finally, uh, you know, one more October, that's enough to get people in, especially for, you know, subscribers. They want people to subscribe both in October is usually their biggest month to get new people, and then they want people in the spring when it's the, the weakest months. Yeah, so if you give people an incentive to come out and watch, like, you could even, here's what, here's my pitch for season or for the series of three TV movies. I would call it Chucky's last spree or Chucky's last dance. And I'm going to resolve all the major storylines as much as I can. I'm going to resolve the thing with um, Jake and his friends. I'm not going to kill the love interest because I don't want to kill the gay coded character. I'm just not into that, but I would have one of the three die or be majorly maimed. And then it becomes a revenge story. I would then, I think they do this, but I'm not 100% sure. Chucky prays to a voodoo uh, entity, Dembala, who grants him the power, I beg of you. But it's basically the power of resurrection. And I would have Dembala send an avatar to Earth and say, look, you have called upon my power countless times. And countless times you have failed. This time you die and I drag you to the abyss and you don't come back. So Chucky has to run for his proverbial undead life. (laughs) And maybe he brings in Jake to like say, look, I just want to live in peace. I'll even live in this box. I just don't want to go to hell. So if you agree to protect me for X amount of days, you can take me in to custody and that's it obviously he stabs jake in the back something happens yeah. and you know you get a huge fight and then the finale for the for all this is you have these two slugging it out and i would find if andy's not dead i would find a way to bring him into it and it's andy with 
Jake fighting Chucky and you bring it back to Chicago where all this started, where the Lakeside Strangler started. And you maybe find the voodoo priest John's, maybe you find a member of his lineage who, cause he's the guy who taught Chucky how to do all this voodoo shit. You, you channel into this Dembala shit and maybe there's a way where you have the war between heaven and hell and these voodoo entity finally come to a head and agreeing to, I guess, I don't know, maybe a final standoff winner take all and Chucky gets put away and isolated whatsoever. And if you want to tease the franchise, because you could do this, you do an arc of the covenant scene. And what I mean by that is you have Chucky <laughs> contained in a box. He can't escape from, and he's being wheeled into a warehouse. And as you're being wheel wheeled into the warehouse, him screaming, let me out, let me out. He goes past the lament configuration from Hellraiser, passes yeah. the neck, the Necronomicon, Jason's mask, Freddy's yeah, let, glove. Let, let me out, let me out. And they're pouring cement into the box around him. Yeah. And then it zooms and out. Yeah, then it zooms out and it's like a warehouse in the middle of nowhere. And there's just all these horror movie artifacts. And you know who locks the door? Bruce Campbell. You don't say that he's Ash. He's like, well, that's enough of that. And he just kind of takes his hands and goes, well, that's enough of that and walks away. And this way you leave the door open for crossover potential. You leave the door open that he can escape and whatever. And the series ends. And if Don Mancini wants to reboot the franchise five, 10 years down the road, you have an option. And there you go. Because no, no, Chucky no. doesn't of, work. Sorry. Instead of Bruce Campbell, it zooms out, <laughs> and it's 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 new Chucky from the movie that we didn't like. <laughs> Actually, I was just about to say that. Like Chucky is one of those franchises where you look at the horror movie genre, the whatever, the whole overview, and certain actors will always be associated with with their roles. Robert England as Freddy. Jackie Earl Haley, was he a good Freddy? I'll go on the fence and say debatable. Some moments, kind of cool. Yeah. Kane Hodder is always going to be Jason. Was Derek Mears bad as him? No, but he's not our Jason. Brad Dorif is always going to be Chucky. Did Mark what? Hamill do a bad Chucky? Yes. No. Was he a good killer doll? He, he, he yes. Was, yeah, I was going to say, he wasn't bad he was just not right for it how about yeah. this it ends there you know they lock up the the warehouse walk away it's two security guards and it's both of them you know walking away like that's lunch be like and that's enough of that shit and they both they both walk away yeah yeah because like <laughs> you want you want to you want to grab lunch and he goes you want to grab lunch yeah sure and it, and it zooms out and it's brad duriff and and mark hamill together see that would be funny and that would work so well and like there's certain roles that you just can't separate but sometimes you can and another example of this just to pull on this string a little bit and we're going to talk about this in the horror movie special we're going to do later on this month with me Enrique and James Rolfe you look at a franchise like Hellraiser which had a Peacock movie a couple of years ago and they rebooted Pinhead Pinhead is Doug Bradley you're always going to have you open the box we came but Lady Pinhead was just as fucking good and very few people bitched I saw so it works with Chucky, the humor and the screen presence is so intertwined. That's why the child's play movie with Mark Hamill didn't work. If that it's, movie had been called yeah. anything but child's play, it would have been fine. It's like, you can't replace the Crypt Keeper. It's always going to be Kassir. Yeah. Always with Chuck, with Chucky, it's going to take a massive step, a massive performer to really embody that role. And it's one of those franchises when Brad Dorif, unfortunately passes on, can you reboot the idea of the killer doll? Yes. You look at Megan, it works. In Ooh, fact, there was even a really funny bit that Chucky did. It was like on YouTube where he's like, who the hell is M3N or whatever. And oh, he's yeah. ranting about 
Megan is like, I'm the original killer doll. Fuck this you know, bitch. You know, and it was I, pretty I, funny. But the I, thing is, you can't do that with each character. Like you can't have Robert England making Fred uh, making fun of Jackie Earl Haley. It doesn't work. So no. Chucky is one of those series where when the original actor passes on, I think the I think the franchise is done. Now you could continue it in comics and like video games, I guess, if you could have someone, and I hate to say this out loud, do an AI of his voice. Hell, you want to continue Chucky? Make a video game. Make a really awesome telltale video game. I think he might even be in Dead Dead by Daylight. I'm not 100% sure. But you can make this franchise live on if you're willing to change mediums. Honestly, I would do comic books, and I would do video games, and I would do it in a telltale uh, format. Get Skybound Entertainment on this right now and wrap up your season four storyline and do it that way. I just don't know what the budget for a game like that might look like versus getting shutter to produce four or three or four mini hour and a half movies. So I don't know. I mean, rip Chucky, I guess we will see the lakeside strangler at some point in the future. We'll see Jennifer Tilly come back. So I guess that's pretty much going to do it for this edition of the Nerd News. And we're going to take a look at a piece of, of computer hardware that Alex talks about. And it's going to be liquid cool and a little bit slick looking as well. So we'll come back right after this with the weird news right here on ThisWeekInGeek.net. Alex, the producer here with another review of one of the Be Quiet products that they sent for us to check out when we were doing our, uh, I guess, upgrade build that I've been talking about in the last few weeks. And I mentioned previously that they sent over another one of their liquid coolers. I had previously talked about the Pure Loop 2FX, uh, the 360 millimeter version. Obviously it comes in a few different sizes. Uh, and they also sent over the Light Loop, which is their newest product. And it's in the same size. Uh, it comes in a couple different colors. You have the option for, you know, black, or you have white, so if you wanted to have it, you know, for the the Dark Base uh, Pro 901 that I've got, you got the white version, or you have the black version you can have, or whatever the aesthetic you want. If you don't want to use one of their own cases and you want to get one that uh, just has a, matches your color scheme, you have that option as well. Uh, and as far as you know, telling the difference, I I was like, okay, how am I going to really tell this? I'm not the most you know technically adept when it comes to being able to measure every little thing here, and what I did easily enough, because I was using those thermal pads that we were talking about the last couple of weeks, I was able to pop off the uh, the Pure Loop 2 cooler and pop in the Light Loop uh, with relative ease, you know, no mess, no cleanup. That's one of the biggest bonus features of using a thermal pad. And I was able to do that, pop it on, and noticed roughly the same cooling because I'm not pushing it too far, but there are going to be some differences. And I went, okay, let's let's do a comparison side by side. And luckily, on their website itself, if you want to compare products, you can do so. And it even has an option to flip a toggle that mentions, hey, show only key differences. And I went, okay, let's check this out. Because I knew that there were some. Uh, and the total weight is roughly the same. It, it, I mean, the, the pure loop is a little bit more so. Um, the main difference being that there's like, ever so slight differences in what the uh, socket compatibility is for Intel um, in, in that the uh, light loop has LGA 1700, 1200, 1150, 1151, 1155. Those are all on uh, as well for the uh, pure loop. But the previous one, the pure loop also supports 2011, um, which is not going to be as common nowadays. Let's be honest here. Uh, the main differences here is... Uh, that at the lowest fan speed, you'll actually get a quieter uh, overall sound from the light loop. The light loop ends up pushing at the lowest at 50% fan speed, uh, 17 decibels. You're looking at 20 for the pure loop. I didn't notice it because I usually have, you know, I guess my fans on higher, but if you're somebody that's more sensitive to that, uh, if you're looking at just doing something at the lower fan speed, you're actually going to end up with uh, a quieter sound from the light loop. Uh, but then, if you crank it up to max, to 100% uh, percent RPMs, you end up with 30, just shy of 37 decibels on the light loop, whereas the Pure Loop 2 was 34. 
So it's sort of that balance. If you're somebody who just wants to run things low and quiet, then you might want to go with the light loop. Um, now, beyond that, you, you get into like some nitty gritty technical stuff. Uh, the pump speed is significantly more on the pure loop, but the light again, the light loop is less. But I didn't notice any major differences in what it could cool. It will probably make a difference when you move into like high high end. Like if you're doing like thread rippers or you're trying to do you know some high-end i9 you know uh, overclocking sort of stuff it, when you get into that performance wise the pure loop 2fx is probably going to be a little better the main difference is that what you're going to see here is just in the aesthetics there is rgb lighting on the pure loop 2fx but the light loop as the name would tell uh, has a lot more. It's a lot brighter. The The actual block itself is more illuminated with RGB. Each of the fans is very bright. Uh, it's ARGB coo uh, cooling block. Uh, illuminated options. Tons of different things. There's. It comes with three of their Light Wings fans on it, which are super colorful. Uh, there is, you know, negligible, I would say, differences when it comes to the cooling between them. It's more of an aesthetic thing unless you're going for, like, extreme overclocking, then you're probably going to go with the other that I talked about previously on here. But, if you're into, like, flashy lights and, and really bright, you know, colorful, expressing yourself sort of situations, then the light loop is probably going to be for you. Uh, if you're into just uh, performance over form, or, sorry, or I guess, like, performance over just you know, how it looks, then you might end up being happier going with what I previously had installed, which was the Pure Loop 2. So it's all going to depend on your aesthetics. Check out their website. I'll have a link in the description here for you to, uh, to look at and determine whether or not, you know, this is going to suit your needs. Either way that you go, I honestly think you've made a pretty good choice because these are like really good build quality and they seem to be quite good coolers. And you also have that uh, designed in Germany, German engineering aesthetic. You just sort of have peace of mind when you're using something here from Be Quiet. Go crazy? Don't mind if I do! Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass Welcome back to This Week in Geek.net. I'm your host, Mike the Birdman. He is Alex, the producer. All right, guys, it is time to talk about some of the weird news that has happened around the world and this dimension of existence this week. And our first story comes courtesy of GamesRadar.com. After hundreds of videos over nine years, 88-year-old Skyrim grandma is retiring because it, quote, isn't fun anymore. I'm tired of her. I'm bored to death with it. Shirley Curry wants to spend more time with her other hobbies. A beloved figure of Skyrim's content creation scene says retiring from making gaming videos. Shirley Curry, better known as Skyrim grandma, posted a video yesterday so this was late last week uh yesterday entitled no more gaming videos in that video curry who is 88 said the decision doesn't make me too happy but confirmed that she's not going to be recording any more gameplay videos explaining the process of capturing and creating videos to start to feel more like an obligation than a desire curry says quote it isn't fun anymore i'm tired of it i'm bored to death of it curry says she plans to continue vlogging from time to time and will use the spare time she now has to engage in other hobbies quote uh if you want to watch me if you want to watch me playing videos, you know I have a lot, and they're all there. Curry's first video was uploaded nine years ago, and she's uploaded hundreds of times since that the prolific schedule combined with Curry's uh, tendency to greet her community as her, quote, grandkids helped turn her into a huge piece of, the, <laughs> of Skyrim's YouTube scene. Her work even caught the attention of Bethesda, which scanned Curry to feature an NPC in the Elder Scrolls 6 and offers a nod to her in Starfield. She's also been embraced by the modding community, who has added her as a Skyrim companion, simply known as Shirley. Um, that's kind of amazing. And there's also a weird kind of note here. It says it takes 14,000 real life steps to trek across Skyrim's massive map, according to a dedicated fan of the RPG who made the journey himself. That's kind of intense. Nine years of content creation on the exact same game. And Skyrim does have that dynamically generated or radiant quest system where you can go do your own shit. And obviously with modding tools, you can do so much extra stuff. But creating videos, like one of the reasons I never got into video content 
is it's a long fucking process. I hate video. I hate sync sounding. I hate trimming things up frame by frame. For audio, it just works. I don't mind trimming a piece of audio to trim off, you know, maybe here's a breath here. Maybe it sounds like there's a bit of a run on sentence. I can add like a breath or two of silence, stuff like that. I don't mind for whatever reason, audio comes naturally to me when it comes to video, I go cross-eyed. And when it comes to <laughs> streaming, I just, I can't do it that consistently. Like I can't be on for that long. I mean, it's different when I'm running a game of like dungeons and dragons and I'm doing my own thing. That's, fine i get that but this i just don't so well that's that's like for me that's why i wanted to if i would do streaming and i'd still do want to you know things got in the way and i did some test streams i'm still going to get my hardware sorted and and fingers crossed i'll have the right exact setup to do it at good quality coming this uh, christmas time uh but the idea is, I like the idea of the VTuber where you don't have to show your face, so you don't have to be like on. You still, you're basically then just doing your voice, and then of course it's capturing and moving around, and and it does, you know, it animates your voice a little bit, so there's still you. I I don't have a problem with showing my face, like I'm not somebody who's afraid to show myself. But you, you're right, like the idea of having to be on and constantly aware of your surroundings the whole time, it can be more taxing. Now, for a grandma like that, she probably wasn't as concerned, but. I can see that. So I think like you and I would make better VTubers than we would like regular video streamers. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Like, like I've got friends in the VTubing space. I mean, obviously there's friend of the show, uh, Connell who does his King Macbeth stuff. Uh, he still does that on like his streams. My, my friend Damien who painted, um, my, uh, tricorder dice tray. He does VTuber stuff. <laughs> and like, and like in my, in my case, when I was doing the test streams, I was using uh, the artwork that Jen made for us as just to sa- just to test, just to see how it goes. And like, eventually, if I like it, you know, maybe I'll go with a like a VTuber suite type thing and just, you know, have have like a caricature of myself put in, uh, you, you know, and then we could go from there. Like editing, I don't mind video editing. I actually liked it. It's just it is a lot more involved. It's a lot more taxing. There is more know how like inserting special effects and layering effects when it comes to audio is a, there's a learning curve but it, it's it's come really natural to you and i anyway video there's more involved there's there's more critiquing of video than there is of audio oh yeah, yeah. like you can you know get I mean? away with like a shitty picture if if like the audio is good but not the other way around yeah um i know with me video editing like i used to work for a cable tv channel in Owen sound many, many moons ago. And I just was never that hot shit at it. Even when I was at Niagara college, we used to have assignments like, okay, your assignment has to be in the Dropbox by 3 PM. I came ludicrously close to missing stuff just because I was so bad at it. And it's just because it just doesn't come naturally yet. When it comes to audio, a twig show, I can edit the, this week's show in usually about, five ten minutes now there are times where i have problems and i don't catch them until much later like i know recently we had a problem with our transfers episode because for whatever reason the upload looked fine to me but there was a problem yet during the editing process boom 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 it looked fine on the waveform and that's just something i get but i don't know video editing i see people who do it on like tiktok and instagram and Short form content is fine. Like if you can use a program like CapCut or even like GarageBand or uh, iMovie, you can do some pretty cool shit with that. But it's not your Adobe Creative Suite. It's not your Final Cut. It's not your um, Avid or After yeah, Effects. I, I've, like I just can't. I've been out that. of the game for so long. I was like in high school. I did a lot of editing and I was doing some crazy shit. And I'd learned a little bit of After Effects and done some layering. At this point, I'd have to be one of those guys that ends up using a, uh, like an easy to use suite from one of the software companies, and I, because I'm not going to be somebody that goes in and masks everything. Now, composition of shots, the actual physical editing of knowing which frame to edit, which angle to use, I'm actually quite good at that. Honestly, uh, it, it's going to be the digital compositing, the how far things have come, even at the amateur level, for putting in uh multi-layered text and and 
you know, funny splashes and stuff like that. That stuff is a learning curve unto itself. And if you haven't been doing it in a long time, sure, there's lots of sweets out there that, that you do generic stuff. And that's fine. You can get away with that. But anything that looks slick and professional, like, it's a lot harder than it used to be, <laughs> even. So Yeah, it's just, it's not one of those things I have any desire to do. I mean, like, I'm happy doing my, my podcast when I do stuff on my Patreon. I do written stuff, not as much as I'd like, but it's easy for me to do a podcast. I'm like, here, I'm like, talk for 30 minutes. Yeah, that's no problem. Yeah. I really should so, get around to doing like, something. But I can totally see at her age why video is becoming tedious unless and especially i mean that game is old like it's old like her <laughs> so yeah like 2011 they're, they're... like that that game's been around a while and as much as the modding scene can do some amazing things with it there's only so much that engine can do there's only so much she can talk about like i mean you see other elderly people that would tell stories while they played games there's like a couple guys that you see pop up on like threads and and insta and all that where the, you'll see little clips and i think there's a grandpa that plays like sniper elite mm -hmm. and he like shows like how good because it's such a simulator right like all these people like have a hard time setting up their shots and the dude is like boom he kills him it's like turns out because the dude was trained as a sniper you know 50 60 years ago <laughs> and so you you get some people that have popped up into that space since then i think she was probably the most famous Wait, wasn't before her, wasn't there a grandpa that played World of Warcraft and, and did YouTube? I think there was something like, like that. I'm, like, I'm talking that early, sounds familiar. Early YouTube, like 07, 08, 09, something like that. I think there was a, a grandpa that played, a grandpa or grandma that played WoW and would talk. Um, and that sort of, that became sort of a genre for a while where it was old people telling stories about their life while they play games. That's kind of yeah. fun. It's like, it's, that's kind of a, a neat little thing, especially for people that you know, maybe grew up and their grandparents had already passed. They didn't have a grandparent. So it is sort of like you have a somewhat extended family and there isn't with somebody like her, there's no agenda. You know what I mean? Like she's not trying yeah, to, she's get, just, I'm just playing a game. Just... The, the only thing she's getting out of it is the idea that she can connect with people again. Yeah. She's of, building. A the, yeah. A lot of the elderly don't have that. They, they don't have that connection with their grandkids or, or kids, or maybe they didn't have any, and they feel lonely. This is a way to somehow, even if it's a parasocial sort of situation, it was a way to interact and reach out, and it can actually keep you younger that way. So it was actually, I don't think anything bad ever came from this. You know what I mean? Nobody no, like, yeah. Played. Yeah, like, honestly, she was a very wholesome thing. The fact that she's referenced in Skyrim, people of, or not Skyrim, in uh starfield she's been modded in she'll be referenced in future bethesda projects i mean honestly that's about the best outcome she could have so honestly thank you shirley for your contributions to the internet space and for being a fairly controversial free figure we do appreciate that because it's always nice not to talk about bad news on this show all right, so our next and last story this week, Alex was able to find from SoraNews24.com. Um, Japan's super cheap corn snacks apologize for second ever price increase in 45 years. This is a long story, so strap in, guys. <laughs> you don't have to read Unabo all. You, you, you can get the gist of it if you want. <laughs> yeah. Unabo continues its absolutely tiny proportionally huge price increase of the 2020s. Part of the appeal of Japan's mega popular Unabo corn puff snack is how manufacturer Yaoken is constantly ad adding new flavors to the lineup, like teriyaki hamburger or cup of noodle. But at the same time, there's a remarkably consistency to Unabo, not just in keeping these longtime favorite flares such as cheese or corn potage but also in price umaki first went on sale in 1979 at the cost of just 10 yen a decade later unabo is still costing 10 yen and 20 years after it hit the marketing it's still only 10 yen unabo held in to its 10 yen a price point all the way until 2022 where the exchange rate made 10 yen the equivalent of about eight cents before Yao Ken announced its first its products first ever price increase to 12 yen uh unabo's 12 year or 12 yen era won't match the longevity of its 43 years at 10 yen though Yao Ken has announced that once again it is raising the price posting a solemn statement in the company's official website and the official unabo twitter account 
Quote, as of October 1st, we will be revising the price of our snack product, uh, Unabo. We will be revising the Unabo's price for the first time since 2022, and we deeply appreciate the kind words and reflection or reactions from our customers uh, during that time. In the pricing Unabo, we've taken into consideration the goal of allowing the children to experience the joy of choosing what to buy w- using their allowances. However, even after 2022, the price of Unabo y- ingredients in general, including key components such as corn and vegetable oil, have continued to rise, and labor, packaging, shipping, and other costs have increased. Have also increased significantly. The situation has progressed beyond even what one company can allow for, and to ensure a continued stability supply of Unabo, it is with it is with deep apologies that. For the shipments beginning of October, we will be implementing a price increase. We ask for understanding during, as we continue to work through and provide a stable supply of Unabo and allowing the overflowing amounts of deliciousness and fun. Starting October 1st, Unabo will cost 15 yen, three times more than they do right now. Though the representation of the largest price increase in the 45-year history of the brand is not exactly throwing any adult fans' budgets much out of whack. And the online reactions have been overwhelmingly understanding and appreciative of y- of Yaoken's honesty and communications with fans. And then it basically just goes into that. 15 yen who gives a shit well um, it, it's what it is they went from being an basically depending on the conversion about a nickel in american to yeah. you know 10 cents Maybe a quarter many, now for, they were 10 cents for many 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 years or eight cents it went when it went down to eight they had to raise it to make the equivalent of 10 it's now 15 cents canadian which would mean it's probably what is that american right now um U.S. dollars, USD. Um, it's ten cents, exactly ten cents. So I'm they, very they, curious what, to so, see if so we what can they've buy done. These. So what they've done is they haven't raised the price. If you look at it from a Canadian or American standard, they've only raised the price within their own country because their their yen isn't doing well. So, so I found one on Amazon, Alex, and I'm yeah. almost tempted to bring back a turd or treasure for this. Or not, or not. Satan's pantry. <laughs> so on October first, I would get this, but I can get Unabo Japanese corn puff snacks, a variety pack, ten flavors and twenty packages for twenty bucks. So that's a little bit more expensive. But basically, for anybody who doesn't know, it's the shape and size of a cigar. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I'm tempted to go down to the Japanese uh, market we have right by my house here and say, Hey, do you have it? In fact, that's maybe not a bad, I, maybe that'll be today's field trip. When I go out after I edit the show today, I'll go look, hi, do you have the weird corn puffs now that cost like a nickel? Um, yeah. Like, like it would be like, if you were to go there in person, it would be 15 cents Canadian or 10 cents American to pick it up. Uh, but you know, for them, it's an increase. What this is, is this is like the equivalent of penny candy that we used to have, which we haven't had penny candy since what? mid 90s when you could still get the little swedish berries for a penny a piece or the the little black what are they blackjacks or what do they call the little black balls mm-hmm. yeah um, i think so and then uh hubba bubba was like and and uh bazooka joe was like a nickel and then they went to 10 cents and i don't think you can get a candy for less than 25 cents anymore at a corner store if they even carry individual candies Right, like it used to be. So this is like a standard of one of those that they had. So I thought it was funny. See, I wanted to have a, a nice, sweet story because your other choice for story this week was about a man that cut off his penis after taking mushrooms, <laughs> which would have been. I don't remember submitting that. I remember the the dogs no, barking no, story. No, that was what I was, it was. My initial submission was about a man chopping his penis off, and I went, you know what? Maybe, We're good. maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Let's, talk, let's talk about the candy. Instead of talking about uh, a dude that took mushrooms and then thought his, penis, himself. thought his penis turned into a demon and chopped it off. So, as you know, you get it here. As you, one you, does. As you one. get to hear the little bit here, but just just know we wanted to edit on a fun note. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no shit. So, yeah, it's like, I don't know. I mean, again, that's kind of cool. I mean, I am going to try and track these things down. I mean, I imagine Miniso might have these, but I'm thinking more the Japanese ethnic you know market what? that's right by my house. Miniso might like it all depends on if they're allowed to be imported certain types of food like they you can get a lot of cool stuff at Miniso uh, so maybe they would have it no wait Miniso is not Japanese Miniso is Chinese 
even oh, okay. though so, Miniso is a company that lies and pretends that they're Japanese. They market themselves as Japanese. They are 100% a Chinese company. They do have Japanese snacks, though. They have Japanese pop and stuff. So they might have it, but you're right. Uh, it would be more of a of a of like an Asian supermarket might have them. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually literally copying the story into my phone right now. So when I go out to do some grocery shopping for my wife, Blair, I'm like, hey, weird question. Do you have these? And it's a, it's a corn puff snack. I mean, I'll give it a whirl for like a couple of cents. So it, it's been whatever. around for 50 years. There ain't no way it's bad. It's terrible. You know what I mean? Like it's. I mean, like we've tried some pretty interesting snack stuff. In fact, actually, I like to go to the Japanese market and I have a thing on my desk. I bought this giant jar. And I keep candy in it for when I have low sugars. And sometimes I just like to have a little bit of one piece of candy once a day. No big deal. And I buy two things. I bought these weird, I, I think they might be Korean or Japanese, but there are these gummy things and they're called high chews. And the ones I have are soda pop flavored and this, ra not ramen, but r ramoon or something. And it's like a sweet, it tastes like cola. Only way I can describe it. Sure. And then there's this other Japanese um, sour, it's like a warhead, but it tastes like soda. Since I can't have Pepsi and Coke anymore, or at least not without great pain, I'm like, okay, you know, that's a good way to get my sweet in. And if I ever need to wake up, it's so sour, that will wake you the fuck up. Um and it's just like, okay, that's certainly a vibe. But yeah, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I've had some really cool things. There's a, another snack that I like. It's a Japanese snack. And it's really hard to find. I bought in the, this entire summer. I've, I've found two bags the entire summer. And they're these little peanut balls. And they're like peanuts covered in this like uh, corn. And they taste, I don't know. They're just like little corn balls with like, a peanut inside it's really really good i'm incredibly sensitive to, to peanuts so I, I can't have too many at once but my uh some of blair's family bought me these shrimp chips and we've had shrimp chips here on the show and they're not terrible well um I, I, on amazon they're the company that had that variety pack that was like 50 bucks they got a 24 dollar pack where it's 30 different snacks and it looks like they have like one or two or looks like three or four of those corn snacks and then mixed with a bunch of different stuff so maybe for christmas we'll do a a, a, a box buy or of something like this and, and that, share, that might and be kind them. of fun I, I i mean one of the other things i i like to do is i love buying all the japanese pokemon snacks and recently with like pokemon horizons um they have this weird little thing and you get like it looks like a pokeball but it's like um shaped like a log so you open it up and you get this little bag of they're kind of like maple flavored corn pops. Only way I can really describe them, you get like 30 in a bag because they're really small, but you get like a little sticker. So I buy them and they're like maybe like 200, 300 calories at most. But mostly I buy them for the sticker and the box because the box is really easy to store dice in. Um, but I don't know. I, I like having an ethnic market here in town because I get a chance to see all these different weird foods, or at least weird to me. Like, I love Pocky. New like, you, that's been. You is probably the more correct term. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, stuff that's new to me. Like, I always like, like to try something different. I, I know there are these weird pizza chips and they they just have like a picture of like a pizza and cheese and they taste like something familiar I've had. And it's strange to see like, Cheetos, for example, in just different company or different yeah. countries packaging. Because as far as I know, they're not anything different than our Cheetos. But you also get weird ones that are or not weird. It's different to me. No, like, there, are, there, like, are, there are some that are legit weird, like like masala you know, that's, or that's, tomato. I wouldn't say that's weird. Weird is when you get things like uh, cucumber, things that are not normally associated with with either potato or corn snacks. Yeah, the, there's like seaweed flavors. I mean, we had deep fried seaweed here on the show the, a couple of years ago. Some of the British ones that are like Walkers, which is the Lay's over there, they got mm -hmm. some stuff that's like liver and onions and stuff. It's like, no, thank you. Uh, yeah. There's those. I'm not, I'm not a fan of prawn or, sh or shrimp that much, but like, I don't mind the prawn well, chips, but you can't eat a whole lot of them. I mean, like, they're fine for those little snack bags. 
I have to go to TNT or, or New City downtown. Uh, not, sometime when Blair and I do uh, uh, a Bond Me pickup, when we go back to your place or something. We'll My have God, to, uh, we haven't had that in like two years. Yeah, we'll, Jesus. We'll, we'll, have to go to, we'll have to go to Bond Me, pick up some Bond Me, and then go in next door and see what they got snack-wise. Because maybe, like now, New City is a Hong Kong supermarket, but they they do stock stuff from other countries and stuff you might mm -hmm. find some of the japanese stuff it's usually more chinese but there or tnt again is another chinese one but again they got a variety of of different countries weirdly enough like loblaw superstore might have some of the japanese stuff in it i uh, could believe that so because like that's where for years like zayers slash superstore was like the only place you could buy pocky for a long time um, like Pocky or uh, I used to find Otis. Pocky at Food Basics when I used to live up in Owen Sound, but it was in the ethnic food section, obviously. But you had to know specifically where to look. Um, yeah, like uh, the other thing was they were the only place you could get the Japanese sodas, you know, where you push the marble down to open it. Yeah, which is again, it's such an, an alien concept to me, but I don't know. Some of those drinks you get from over there are kind of interesting like i i like getting anything that's associated with an ip i used to get these really awesome pokemon sodas i've had really good dragon ball sodas stuff like that but well, now pokemon that we've sodas, had you can find at pretty much any asian supermarket they'll have pokemon yeah. ones the dbz ones are kind of hard to find uh they'll have one piece ones though one piece and like naruto attack on titan and attack on titan stuff yeah yeah which I remember, like, if you go to, like, any anime convention, there's always somebody selling those type of snacks because I know they'll sell out. And I know all of us over here in North America will buy it up because it's well, like, different to us. Not to mention, like, you want to talk about how permeated into culture certain Japanese shows are, like, like the boomer parents that have no idea about anything, right? Like, our parents, like, my dad knew the difference between a, a PlayStation and a, and a Nintendo and that because he's a tech guy, but not really what the games were. You know, to my mom and to every mom out there, everything was a Nintendo, right? Yeah. Everything's a Nintendo, a Mario. She knew what Sonic was because there were enough cartoons and, like, Burger King toys. Like, Sonic was enough to know, but she was like, oh, Sonic, that's another one of those Nintendo games, you know, in her head, right? Yeah. And now, nowadays, that it, it is, right? But back then, that's what she thought. It was like this. She knew that. My dad knew Dragon Ball Z because he thought uh, Mr. Popo was hilariously racist. <laughs> to this day, he's like, what is that? And he's like, Mr. Popo. He's like, no, no, what's his name? Like, Mr. Popo. And he was in hysterics laughing at it. He's like, that's so offensive. And he's just laughing so hard. Uh, and, and whenever Dragon Ball Z would be on, my brother would be watching it. He'd walk by and my dad would just start screaming at the top of his lungs. <laughs> because every time he walked by, it would be Goku training for three episodes in a row. Um so there's that but you ask them anything they won't know that like my mom will know like oh like she'll know donkey kong is like king kong she'll think of that she know she knows mario and that this she won't know anything about any anime show at all but she'll walk by and go oh that's pikachu like she'll know that that's a pokemon everybody knows pikachu i, I think pikachu is as recognizable as mario and that's why you go to any grocery store and if they're gonna have a licensed video game character on anything that they're going to carry it's going to be pikachu and yeah that's pretty much what we've got when it comes to the weird stuff this week i talked about how we were going to have a strange story in here that i decided not to put in because there's a little bit too much and uh wanted to finish on something fun so that's going to do it for the weird news this week we're going to take a quick break and get into one of michael's reviews and come back here at the end for I guess the closing of the show and to talk about what's coming up next. Hey guys, this is Mike the Birdman here. I'm here to talk about something kind of fun we got sent from our friends over at Warner Brothers Home Entertainment and Adult Swim. I'm going to be talking about the Rick and Morty Complete Seasons 1-7 to on DVD. So first things first, this is pretty much a straight repack, though it does come with something exclusive. It actually does come with a new exclusive poster, which is a little bit bigger than what I thought. It features a lot of characters like uh, Evil Morty, uh, Mr. Poopy Butthole, uh, different versions of Rick and other strange characters that have appeared throughout the entirety of the 70 plus uh, episodes of the Rick and Morty uh, television show. And if you've been putting off getting this show in one complete more or less box set, 
this is a pretty good way to go about it. Um, there is the availability to get the other seasons on Blu-ray, if that's your thing. But getting it on DVD, as far as I'm concerned, is fine. I know some people are a stickler for higher quality. When it comes to this type of stuff, I'm more or less fine with it. Um, I find it doesn't really matter. You can crucify me in, in the comments later for it. I mean... Rick and Morty has become one of those cultural f phenomenon shows. You either love it or hate it. The bizarre humor, uh, the Szechuan sauce meme, which, uh, believe me, I stocked up when Szechuan sauce came back this, this like last summer. I'm actually out now. That's sad and totally a thing. So maybe I will also have my own uh, character arc where I go back in time. But regardless, though, um, having all this in one complete uh, box set is really nice. My only major complaint with this set is I don't like how the discs are stacked up. They do that weird book thing where it's like so it's like one on top, one on the bottom. And I really don't know how you'd fix it because I do find a lot of discs tend to fall out and get scratched like this. Although this one seems a little bit better put together than a recent release I looked at from Succession. Um, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not a fan of this style of packaging. And it's just probably just a personal preference, but I do know a number of people who do collect physical media. They do often complain that a lot of their discs do get scratched if they happen to get knocked out of the case. However, though, in terms of collecting the entire series in one complete, more or less, package as it currently stands, this is a fantastic value. It's right there. You get all the special features that have ever been released. And you do get a pretty nice exclusive poster. Like I said, it's a little bit bigger than what I thought. It's a little bit more detailed. Uh, than what I've thought. So if you've ever wanted to follow the adventures of Rick Sanchez and Morty as they travel the multiverse and have strange adventures with Anson and his eyes Johnson, uh, Bird Person, uh, Mr. Poop, Poopy Butthole, and who could forget Noob Noob? This is definitely a series you should definitely uh, check out. So once again, that is Rick and Morty, the complete seasons one to seven on DVD, coming to us from our friends over at Warner Brothers Home Entertainment. Hey guys, welcome back to This Week in Geek.net, where we've actually had a surprising amount of technical issues in the background here for this show. So hopefully it all sounds good as far as we know. Um, you don't know any worse, so ha ha. Um, yeah, it's been weird with my computer recently, and I'm discovering things by talking to Alex and my friend Lewis. I didn't know about computers. Um, there's a reason why Mike doesn't deal with computers, because my idea, if it doesn't work, it's either A, throw money at it, or B, hit it with a hammer both of which are great solutions for di for different outcomes um grr i hate it um and it's so funny because i remember when we transitioned years ago to discord and we were using a different program and it just didn't work and now i can't hear you what in the actual i'm pretty fuck? sure you can Okay, now I can. For some reason, I couldn't hear you. Uh, <laughs> it's it's one I wasn't of those talking. days. I wasn't talking. And this okay, is I, I wired in for everything. That's why I keep suggesting that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I may have to transition back. So hopefully I can find... Because my wife tends to put stuff away in a closet. I'm like, okay, yeah, this works and this works for now. So yeah, I think I, think I know where my headphones are. I just have to dig them out. Because right now I'm wearing a Razer... Kraken kitty headset, which makes my ears glow and I look really cool. I think anyway. My mom says but, I'm cool. But there anything with wireless, there's always either a delay or potentially issues with crosstalk. So which is so weird because like I use these to play D D and it's usually pretty good, but it seems like Discord for me has just been really sketchy. But we also did some troubleshooting uh before we came back for our like kind of extra here. So hopefully it fixes it. Um fortunately thanks to alex and my friend lewis i really got around like okay shit's acting weird back up back up now red alert black alert we're freaking out now but we're good uh we checked all my drives my drives are working fine ultimately like i remember when i was younger i used to have a grip on this stuff i understood hardware i understood when things are going wrong but now i've reached that ripe old man age where i'm like i don't get it it doesn't work you if made I press the button, a cardinal mistake early in your career, and that you were an Apple person, so you didn't have to learn how to do anything. <laughs> well, it's so weird. I started out on PC, 
And then I stayed with Apple through most of college. And then when I came back to the PC environment around 2011, my friend uh, Brandon gave me a computer as a wedding gift. And I held on to that fucker for years. And that was the computer you eventually transitioned me into. And I built another one back in 2016. And then we built my new computer back in 2019. Yeah. It's been just a mess of computer hardware. And my computer is obviously coming up on a couple years old now. Well, we so I, part of my reviews I've been talking about is I'm trying to transition myself into some better hardware because what we built were the top of the line 1080p gaming PCs because we weren't doing a ton of uh, gaming on PC, but now the lines are a little more blurred with releases. So it makes yeah. more sense to do that. Um, and we, the Ryzen 3600 is, you know, a workhorse of a value of a CPU that we both got. It's also at five years old now. And yeah. this is, this is the point where you have to seriously start considering this is a great PC for media consumption for basic use. The amount that you and I use it for our media consumption though, it is our main line, like television. Like we use it to watch streaming, to watch everything. Like it, it gets to the point where. You go, okay, I've got maybe, what, two years left on this thing if I keep it in good condition? You don't want to be put into a situation where it just dies on you. So now yeah. is the time to start looking at, at upgrading but keeping this as your backup, you know, in case yeah. you Yeah, like it's – like for me, computers are a special kind of terrifying because I don't understand them anymore. And I used to think maybe it's just me, old man, shaking his fist at cloud. But – at least having you and having Lewis and other people who are computer knowledgeable, it's helpful. It's not scary to me anymore as it used to be. You don't have to be like Garth. We fear change and start. Yeah, ex exactly. Like, like Wayne's world. <laughs> yeah. Like it's something that I just, I'm learning. I'm still trying to get my like kind of head around and you know, maybe I'll get lucky and I'll get a really nice kind of payday or, you know, one of my jobs that I apply for, or maybe I'll just write a bunch of stuff for like Star you, Trek and I get a bunch of nice gigs You are the um, person and I can upgrade you, a PC. When you retire, you will be the person that pays for software as a service where you just pay to log in remotely. And as long as you have an internet connection, you have access to your stuff in the cloud. That's who you'll be because you just don't want to have to deal with it. Yeah. Cause honestly, like I don't have, I don't have the mental real estate to deal with stuff that just doesn't work and you know hey, when patience something breaks is not your, patience is not your middle name <laughs> yeah especially when it comes to tech i tend to freak out immediately yeah. now that's good for when i have to react in the moment and there's a problem i could jump on it immediately because i'm like oh fuck there's a problem i got maybe two two hours to solve it how can i work the solution but it's panicky because it doesn't do well for my anxiety. Let me tell you that much. And, you know, you live like 45 minutes, an hour away. So getting you is a two hour round trip. And yeah, that's well, just my anxiety ticking away. I'm thinking, oh God, oh God, oh God. If it's something that's big and needs to be done, we can do it within a half day, but it is a half day commitment for us. Yeah. Like it, it, it's ultimately really kind of scary for me. So hopefully guys, like I said, you will, uh, Yo, stick with us. And like I said, I do apologize. We we did have a problem earlier this week with our transfers episode. I was notified via David Denoyer. We did have an issue with it. That has now been resolved. So you may have to re-download it via your podcatcher, but it's been re-uploaded on the yeah. website. Should work fine now. If you um, listen to us via our website uh, or Spreaker, it, it's auto, it was instantly fixed. If you had downloaded it previously, you may have to manually re-download from your podcatcher, uh, and if it's on YouTube, it's not going to be fixed because <laughs> just how yes. they're how you can't really replace the file the same way. Yeah, and it's not worth us re kind of uploading it again. So, um, speaking of recording, I am working with Dave and my friend Pat, who actually. This guy, Pat, he's been a fan of Twig for many years. I actually used to play Mass Effect 3 with him online, with him, with him, my friend Brandon and Tiffany and a few other people back when we were playing Mass Effect 3 on the Xbox 360 and the Xbox One. And it was his birthday the other day. And he called me and said, Mike, I've been with you since the screw attack days. I've been with you since high school. And I just want to say thank you for being a really dependable friend. Thank you for inspiring me to get into radio 
just thank you for being a good person. Like, thank you for being you. And I'm thinking that was really nice to hear. And I really, really appreciate that. So Patrick, happy birthday. And he's going to be joining me and Dave on the show sometime during the next week or so. And we're going to be talking about the new Halloween trilogy, Halloween, Halloween kills and Halloween ends, which I've got thoughts. And we're also going to be recording our second part of the Trancers franchise, uh, Jack Death uh, 4 through 6, and that'll come out at some point. Uh, probably during our hiatus, maybe before then. Isn't, um, the, isn't the sixth one the one that he's not even in? Yeah, he's in it via archival footage, and that one I can actually kind of defend, but from a very different perspective. Um, so it's Save it for the show. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to save it for the show because I'm going to make some pretty interesting pitches there too so yeah we're gonna be talking about that i know ken and i recorded a japanese horror loose cannon where we looked at the japanese movie from 1977 house and the 2010 adaptation of king of thorn again i've got thoughts and i'll just say this as a opening to that aren't we naughty and it is a very bizarre experience. But if you want to see a uh, house right now, you can go on Shutter and Amazon. I even think Tubi, you can watch it. And it's a very, very strange Japanese movie. And that's all I'm going to say. Um, it's Ken. You don't, you don't so much see this movie as you do experience it. That's all I can really say about it. Much <laughs> like you've sprung stuff on me before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wow. So yeah, we're going to be doing that. I'm going to be going to the movies this week. I'm going to go see Joker 2. I'm sure that will be a delightful experience. Yeah, I, 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 got, um, I used one of my free tickets to go see that and it was automatically upgraded to the VIP seats with the the, the armrests and like the table and the seat warmer and all that. So my experience will be great, even if the movie is not as good as the previous one from what I've been hearing. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to go see that on Thursday. And then on Sunday, um, we're going to be recording the show probably earlier in the day because me and Liam are going to go see one of the Gundam movies in Japanese with Eng English subtitles. And this will be my first experience with the Japanese UC timeline. It's so like really two and a half hours long, by the way. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a marathon. But I saw N Ninja Scroll in theaters, and I really enjoyed it. So I'm hoping this will be continuing. Cause I think they I think they do one Gundam movie a month until like next it's, year at some point. No, there's there's all three in the same month. Oh, okay. Because our theater yeah. hasn't like spread out over ours. A while, is, like so. our local one is like the third, the tenth, and then like the fifteenth or something. Yeah. So that'll be an interesting experience. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I'm hoping to see a lot more movies in theaters as well i can still drive to the theater like i'm looking forward to seeing uh terrifier 3 when that comes out i actually may even go down to toronto as an experimental day trip to see how that might work out for gonna, me oh that'd be neat are you gonna try smile 2 i'm gonna try because i wasn't i like smile 2 un, until the ending the ending i fucking hated yeah. but um i'll give it a whirl and see what happens maybe it'll bring a smile to my face but that's going to do it for us here at um, uh this week in i should say what do we got coming up on the site this week yes that's what i was going to get into here because we got a fair bit actually uh later on we should have a turn of treasure at some point either this week or maybe early next but honestly probably this week was we have a bunch of stuff that we want to talk about that we couldn't get into the show we've also got a future imperfect on space raiders that we've previously teased and talked about and uh, we'll be recording a follow-up to that soon as well. So that's coming out on Wednesday. On Thursday, we have uh, the Earth vs. Soup episode, The Cosmic Man from 1959. So Aaron and Darlene get into that. And following uh, up that on Saturday, we have the second of our Twig Classic uh, monthly topic shows. This is monthly topic show number 126 from whatever year that was. <laughs> which I is guess 2013? Uh, something around there because it's aliens with James Rolfe. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that should be a lot of fun. I know I am planning on doing something with alien Romulus, uh, when that gets released on digital at some point soon. And I'm pitching some stuff to some of the other people that we work with, like Dave and Ken. Um, recently I've come into possession of the dead rising movies, uh, dead rising watchtower and dead rising. I think it's called Endgame or something. So maybe we will be talking about those and see if Frank West has indeed covered more than wars because these are video game movies. You forgot existed. So we'll be talking about those at some point. I'm sure 
Plus, like I said, me, Enrique, and Dave will be, or me, Enrique, and James will be recording something towards the end of the month, and that'll be our annual Halloween topic show talking about horror reboots that actually worked. So we'll be doing that and more. Plus, there should be another story from me on Weekly Spooky uh, coming up really soon, I want to say, for Canadian Thanksgiving. So I'll make sure to bug Enrique about that. And as soon as I have information, I'm sure it'll be posted up on the website. So anyway... For This Week in Geek, we have been Alex, the producer. I've been Mike, the Birdman, saying welcome back, guys, to the newest season of Twig as we run until the end of the year. But until that time, be excellent to each other. We'll catch you guys again next time right here on ThisWeekinGeek.net. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Thanks for listening to this episode of This Week in Geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember, lower your shields and surrender your listenership. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.